My name is Josh Ginsberg. Uh, I am a member of the board of the Salisbury Forum, and I'm here to welcome you and to introduce our speaker tonight, Richard Fuller. And it is a real pleasure. 20 years ago, plus a couple, but we're not counting. An old friend of mine, uh, who's an environmental leader in New York, told me she told me she wanted me to meet someone, and I said she'll find anything for you. And she introduced me to tonight's speaker, Richard Fuller. Now, Richard is a passionate Aussie, which is probably redundant. Uh, if you're saying he's an Aussie, that means he's passionate. And at the time, he had, in just under a decade, built one of the nation's first firms that did sustainability management for corporations, uh, universities, and, and other institutional clients, a company called Great Forest. And when I met Richard, he was talking about what he'd done, but also there was, there was this idea of doing something else, that, that having a highly successful, novel, cutting-edge company called the University of the World Trade Center, everybody and their sister, had taken on uh, uh, as a client at Great Forest wasn't enough. He was bored and he was 37, whatever the crazy young age we were back then. Um, he was an ardent lifelong environmentalist. He'd paddled around the Amazon, he'd gone around the outback, and he wanted to do something better for society. And the way, the reason he came to me was because I just opened a program in Cambodia for the Wildlife Conservation Society, and he was interested in going down to Cambodia, and off he went, thinking, I think when he left, that he was going to figure out how to work with us to save the wildlife of Cambodia. And Richard came back, and he started, we had a big lunch, and we were talking, and he was talking about just how difficult it was, and oh my God, the bureaucracy of this. He said, and you know, there's so much pollution there, and they just don't know what they're doing with waste disposal, and the hospital waste goes, and he just kept going. And after I said, yeah, and I said, somebody should do something about that. <laughs> uh, and that uh, led Richard to start thinking about doing something about that, and uh, for 15 years, I served as a founding board member on the Blacksmith Institute, now Pure Earth. Uh, and it was uh, a time I'm very, very proud of. Pure Earth is, I think, like no other organization. We use the word unique quite loosely. Um, it can be more unique, but it is unique. Uh, and it's unique because it is the only institution I know of whose sole focus is on remediating pollution in the developing world uh, with a focus on toxic toxics that cause significant public health risks, particularly to children. And it's astonishing to me that you know we're all really aware of, of Superfund sites, and, and they're all over the world. And there are Superfund sites, and they are, are in the poorest parts of countries all over the world. And that there is an institution out there who has made it their mission, and that there is Richard Fuller who has made it his life's mission to go out there, identify these sites, figure out how bad they are, rank them, and then one by one pick them up and clean them up and uh, make people's lives better is a remarkable thing. And so we are extremely lucky and I am extremely pleased uh, to welcome Richard Fuller to the Salisbury Forum. Man. Thank you all. Thank you for having me, Josh. That's a really lovely introduction. Good on you, mate. Beauty. And uh, thank you for being here in this beautiful town. I was uh, delighted to drive up and start to see daffodils poking up and beautiful countryside. Um, this is a paradise to live in. And, uh, and the kids I've met today have been absolutely exciting and brilliant too. I'm just thrilled to be here. It's really fantastic. And uh, I want to spend a bit of time talking to you about my work, but I always like to do this by putting it into a little bit of context first. So let's start about the main place and the main place of context, this beautiful planet that we live on. Okay, it's not all Salisbury, but it's still extraordinary almost everywhere you go. And uh, I wanted to get a sense from you all how you think we're doing. You know, this last 10, 20 years, a lot of noise. We hear a whole bunch of crazy things and stories and we're all doomed and terrible problems going on and it's not just climate change, it's biodiversity problems and then it's uh, issues related to refugees and technology and, and the wall and border and all these sort of things. And I wonder, do you feel like I do just Overwhelmed? Is this like just extraordinary? Are we all going to hell in a handbasket? Is the world coming to an end? Yes. A 
well, let's have a look. One thing I've learned in doing this work um, over the last 20 years, and this is our 20th year anniversary at Pure Earth, is it's critically important to go back to science and look at what the facts are in all of this. And what does the science say about how the world is doing? So this is, I think, the first starting point for any discussion on how the world is doing is this particular graph. This is a graph of population from 10,000 BC, oops, to now, and what's happened. And you can see the world has just fallen off a cliff in terms of population in the last 100 years. I'll give you a few facts in a second, but there's a few things that are important to know here. Since 1950, which was almost when I was born, I was born in 1960, but since 1950, the population has tripled on the planet. Extraordinary growth. And now we're at almost 8 billion people. So in 1950, there was 2.5 billion people. In 1900, there was 1 billion people. And in that time, uh, enormous uh, has been going on. And if, to put it in context, the number of people who are born each year, 130 million born, 55 million who die each year. So that difference, that 80-odd million people are adding to the population every year. But what's good to know is that that 80 million is also reducing over time. And so the projections all show, quite, quite good projections are showing that we will flatten out at 10 or 11 billion by about 2050. So we're going like up like this and then flattening out. And this is the <coughs> extraordinary period of change that's going on in the world. And we are living in the middle of it. To kind of get a sense for that, if you were to be born right now, the chances, well, let me put it another way. If you look at all of the human beings that have been born since the beginning of time, from cavemen through to Egyptians, the Roman Empire, the, the plague, China, its extraordinary growth, all the rest. You think of all those people. The chance that you are alive right now is 8%. So it's the time we're in right now is the time of the planet, is the time of all of history of humankind is right now. And the question is, what would you do if you were trying to connect 8% of people, you could actually connect with 8% of all the people that have ever lived. That doesn't mean, uh, you, you know, you could send them a text message, for example. Uh, maybe you wouldn't send them that text message. But people are physically in contact, and more people are in contact now than they ever have been. What has happened in this last period that we've gone kaboom in population? I want to show you a few slides that show some amazing results. This one first is about poverty change since 1800s. The number of people on the planet, the percentage of people on the planet who live hand to mouth, not having enough food each day. Right now, that's classified by World Bank at around $1.60 per person. And it used to be that 95% of the population, 94% in 1820, were at that level. It was only the very rich that lived well. Everyone else lived dirt floors, you know, abject poverty. Since then, there's only less than 10% of people now that live like that. When you think of the developing world, when I was uh, in high school, I would always have this vision of it being poor people in Africa carrying water back and forth to their houses and living very poor. That's no longer true. The majority of the developing world now are middle class. They have refrigerators and televisions. They go out to restaurants. They go on vacation. They have a motorcycle, sometimes a car. The majority of the world now has become middle class. And in doing, as they've done that, life expectancy has grown too. This is life expectancy through the same period, 45 here, up to 85 right now. These two dips. World War I, World War II. But life expectancy has just grown enormously. So the point now, we're adding one third of a year of life expectancy every year. So that 
that is equivalent to four months every year being added on average life expectancy. If you're born um, after the millennia, after 2000, the chances are that you will live to be more than 100 years old at the moment. This is fantastic. This is extraordinary stuff. And child mortality has dropped significantly. Here was at 40, 35%. These are the number of children who die before the age of five has also gone dramatically. And a lot of that is because of such uh, efforts in different areas. Malaria, for example, malaria deaths were uh, at 800,000 here in 2000. And thanks to Gates and all of his fantastic work, we're down now around 400,000 deaths and still dropping in that area as well. And some other statistics I think are really exciting too. This is um, deaths from war. So, you know, when you're thinking about war and violence, we always think that's getting worse, right? But no, it's not. This is from the 1940s down to now. There's a steady decline here of deaths from war. And it's not just deaths from war, it's also homicides. This is homicide rates going back to the 1300s also showing a steady decline. So we're getting better at living with each other. We've got more people on the planet, but we're getting better at living with each other. This doesn't fit with the slides I showed at the very beginning, all those drama stories, does it? But this is what the science shows. We're also getting better at feeding everyone. So while we've got now almost 8 billion people on the planet, we have, in fact, this is the number of calories per person by different um, regions. North America at the top has more than three and a half thousand calories per person, which is why we've got an obesity <laughs> epidemic, right? But this is what's exciting here. Africa is already over two and a half thousand calories per person. So we're producing enough food. And by the way, we're doing that generally without clearing many more forests. Most of this is increases in yield in crops. So an acre of land um, of corn, rice, and wheat in the last, from 50 years ago, will grow seven to 15 times more product per acre than from 15 years ago. Um, literacy also has dramatically improved. 90% illiterate in 1800, 10% uh, illiterate now. And I love this chart too. <laughs> So we're actually kind of getting kinder to each other and better at being able to, um, to work with each other. Now, I, I want to talk about all these things because I want to show you something that's getting worse. Because in the middle of all of this extraordinary growth in economic well-being that's occurred in the world as this population has grown, there are some unintended consequences that have come about. And you know of some of them already. Um, Climate change is obviously there and present. And biodiversity, and I just want to uh, thank Josh for all of his work in this, uh, of course, over many, many decades. And oceans, a great deal of pressure on oceans, and you can name more. But the one that I wanted to talk about is one that generally people don't think about too much, which, of course, is pollution. And we don't worry so much about pollution here in Salisbury, neither do we in New York State, and neither really do we in the US. There's a little bit of it now and then. Perhaps the Hudson River, when it rains, there's some sewage flush into it. We might worry about plastic litter and things like this. But to be honest, in the 50s and 60s, the big deal issues were dealt with, right? Pittsburgh had air pollution like crazy terrible life expectancy from people who lived in Pittsburgh. We had Love Canal where kids were dying from toxins upstate New York. All these things have generally been addressed over the last three or four centuries, uh, three or four decades. Yeah. But not overseas. And that's the issue that we need to put back into our thinking and into our memory, is that this issue really hasn't been adequately addressed in most countries overseas. So I want to go through um, this, first of all, by giving you a little bit of science, and then I'll show you how these projects and how this program works starts and shows all that. But let me, first of all, uh, give you some of the data from a report that I put together with 50 
top scientists from around the world. This commission on pollution and health was published in The Lancet about a year and a half ago. And it got uh, a fantastic amount of press. We um, had over two billion eyeballs uh, on this commission report, and every major media covered it. I was on uh, the BBC, I think, uh, 17 times on their news channels over this period when it came out. And Lancet said it was the single most successful publication that they'd ever put out. So I was very, very excited by it. But let me show you the key, couple of key findings from doing this analysis on pollution and its health impact in the world and show you some of the key things that go on there. First, pollution actually is the single largest cause of death. When you aggregate death, people dying early from pollution. Let me show you uh, Ebola. This was the, the year of Ebola. There's the number of deaths. It was, uh, I think, around 20,000 people. Um, war and murder, 2015. Iraq war was going on, and there were around 150,000 deaths, including not just the US, of course, the whole of that war. Road accidents uh, killed a million and change that year. And malnutrition, which is, you know, that uh, people living under a dollar a day sort of problem, was a responsible for about 1.7 million deaths. Um, drugs and alcohol, including uh, opiates, alcohol, global, by the way, is uh, at this level. Um, HIV, malaria, and tuberculosis, the big infectious three, the ones that all of the Gates Foundation and all of the uh, global funding goes towards, was responsible for three million deaths. I was amazed that salt, high blood pressure, is responsible for around four million deaths, and smoking is seven million deaths. You know, there's still a lot of smoking in Asia and Africa and all through. But this is pollution. Pollution was responsible for nine million deaths. Uh, one in six deaths in 2015 was directly attributable to exposure to toxic materials, either toxins in the air, in water, or in soil and chemicals. Air pollution was responsible for around five and a half million of this nine million. Water pollution, the sanitation mostly, about one and a half million. And around two million deaths were attributable to chemicals and soil pollution. So, you know, it is absolutely the largest cause of death, but it is a problem in the poorer countries. Here are the countries that have the highest concentration of pollution deaths. So this is the percentage of deaths versus from pollution versus total number of deaths in that country. And the red countries, one in four deaths are because of pollution. So that's India and parts of Africa and, and, and Southeast Asia. You know, one in four people who died actually died because they had crappy air or ate something toxic or walked on dis, uh, destroyed land or drank bad water. One of the things also we did was we broke pollution into two parts. Pollution from traditional sources, which is mostly about sanitation, things that as economies grow, naturally improve. And so we call this traditional pollution, and you can see here, that's the brown line, and over time, that is improving. And we've been investing in sanitation and traditional pollution issues um, since 2000 in the Millennium Development Goals, and it's worked. But modern pollution, this is pollution associated with industrialization and urbanization. It's two extraordinary forces that have been going on and changing the world. That is the area that we don't focus on and where there is very little focus within government development agencies and it's getting worse. And that's the piece that we focus on in Pure Earth. So, that brings me to Pure Earth and what we do. What I thought I would do to give you the introduction to my life in pollution is show you a little video. We are living in hopeful times. Around the world, real progress is being made against malaria, illiteracy, extreme poverty, and many other previously intractable problems. But some crises, we are just beginning to understand. In the poorest countries, many families survive by recycling lead batteries. They are not aware that they are poisoning themselves, their children, and the environment in the process. Millions of independent gold miners use mercury to extract gold particles from the earth, releasing this toxin into the water, soil, and food chain. 
In other locations, men, women, and children scavenge e-waste dump sites to dismantle and burn components to extract valuable metals, exposing themselves to dangerous fumes and a host of toxic chemicals and substances. And for families unlucky enough to live close to abandoned industrial sites, they are exposed to deadly levels of invisible toxins every day for generations. These are big problems, affecting over 200 million people worldwide, causing disability and early death. But we have solutions, and they're surprisingly simple and affordable. Pure Earth discovers and assesses toxic waste sites around the world. We find and empower local partners and work with them to identify and measure the toxins involved. We help them assess the health risks to the local population and execute a cleanup and remediation strategy. Education programs to raise awareness, reduce toxic exposure, and stop recontamination are at the center of our work. In Dakar, Senegal, where dozens of children died from lead poisoning, we led a cleanup and helped local women launch micro-enterprises to replace their toxic work. In Indonesia, Bolivia, and Mongolia, Pure Earth is training miners in alternative methods of gold extraction with a range of mercury-free technologies. In Ghana, we are providing wire stripping units that eliminate the need to burn off plastic coating to get at the valuable copper wire. And in Haina, in the Dominican Republic, after we cleaned up communities surrounding an abandoned lead smelter, Blood lead levels have fallen for thousands living in the area. The risk of permanent brain damage and death has been massively reduced for children born here. But there are far too many sites around the world, just like Haina, where children are being damaged every day from exposure to toxic pollutants. To expand our work and save more lives, we need your help. Please visit our website, pureearth.org, to learn more. Make a donation. Spread the word on social media. Cleaning up one community at a time brings us closer to a purer earth. I'm kind of proud that this organization in 20 years has gotten to the point where we can have a professional, gorgeous video showing us examples like this. And Josh, could you have believed it when we started talking about Cambodia and problems and all the rest of it, that we could get to this point? I'm really thrilled about all of this. And... Uh, I wanted to show you a few examples of how this has happened and give you a little bit of the timeline of all of this because it's been a crazy and curious path for us uh, to be able to get there. And more interestingly now, we're starting now to get a sense of what needs to happen to deal with this problem at scale. We talked about 200 million people being exposed and I said 9 million deaths, one in six a year. In fact, the 200 million it's now, we know, more like 1.3 billion people who are exposed at levels that are dangerous. And the 9 million deaths will actually grow a little bit as some of the science expands as well. So there's a lot to do out there. And the question and the trick is how to scale up this effort. And we've got some ideas, and we're really starting to work on that. But let me show you how all good things start. And of course, it's with your best friend and a glass of wine. And this is Peter Hosking, my school, um, school pal uh, from Australia. And he and I decided we would go and visit some of these toxic sites around the world and uh, see what we could do. And we just went out there with money from a great forest, the consulting firm that I started. And we would go out and find things that we could do once we found something that was pollution related. In Dar es Salaam, this river, this stream, would run blue with this very nasty toxic dye every time the local toothpaste company wanted to not run its production plant to, for, uh, for cleanup. And we did something very simple. We started a small nonprofit, and it had two guys who every day would alternate at five in the morning to go out and see whether the stream was blue or not, or red or pink. And if they found something, they would do two things. They would first, they would, they would call the uh, uh, the uh, environmental agency and say there's something going on. Then they would call the factory itself, and then they'd do three. And the third thing they do is they'll call the newspaper. <laughs> and, and it worked. And within a few weeks, that never happened anymore. And this group grew, and now is a successful advocacy-based NGO, doing great work. And you know, other places here in 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 India, we weren't so successful. This gorgeous kid we rescued, he was sitting on top of this pile of leather trimmings from a local tannery. 
and they were watering it with uh, chromium, hexavalent chromium, which is really toxic. It de really destroys the, the GI system. And these kids were sitting there, and they were chewing on these pieces of leather. And you know, it was like uh, beef jerky or something. It was just something to eat. They're so hungry. And we, we tried to find a way to stop this whole practice going on without really much luck. And the more we started looking for things that were toxic like this, the more we started to find them too. Here in Cambodia, we looked at um, waste dump sites and helped with uh, waste of different sorts. I even ended up in um, uh, Russia, and you know, no surprises, it's radionuclides in Russia that was the issue. And this, this particular site um, is a little town on the Techa River. And about 30 years ago, there was a nuclear accident larger than Chernobyl that no one heard about, where they released twice as much radiation as Chernobyl, but most of it into the river. And it flow, f flowed down the river, and much of it collected on the banks of the river and is still there and causing problems. We did the simplest thing. I think I spent um, $8,000 and hired a team of people, along with technical support, to, to assist, um, to go and dig up the worst of the radionuclides on the place where the kids were swimming, the swimming beach. You know, you couldn't do the entire river, but it had aggregated in this one spot where they were swimming. So we created a safe disposal site. We dug a big hole in the ground and put a, a plastic or a, or a rubber liner in it and put all of the contaminated stuff in there and sealed it up. And then for the rest of the contamination on the beach, we grew a vetiver grass and it absorbed the metals and we, we harvested those and we put them in the hazardous uh, site and got it to the point that the beach was safe for the kids. Not expensive, simple to do. The local government loved it. They started doing it in other spots that they could find up and down the river, again, with, you know, with our technical support helping them. Simple things like that. A lot of stuff to do in India. This is an industrial estate with just horrible toxins coming out of it and going down into... Uh, a place uh, where they draw drinking water further down. And here, this in um, Ahmedabad, in the western part of India, in Gujarat, and the local industries would throw their toxic material, their waste material, onto the ground like this. And this was right next to a school, so the kids were walking through all of this. This is, again, the leader of our technical advisory group, a chap called Jack Caravanos, who's at uh, NYU, who's a terrific scientist. Um, and uh, what we did here was reasonably similar. We took the top uh, worst material and we shipped it off to a hazardous waste disposal facility. They actually have them in India. And then we used earthworms for the second phase. So there's an Australian earthworm that actually they have in India already. It grows to being about 80 centimeters in size. It's kind of a pink on the bottom and clear on the top. It's a strange looking thing. And it bioaccumulates toxins. So you put it on the, on the soil and it buries down. It goes down about almost two meters. And as it's doing it, it eats the soil, bioaccumulates all of these heavy metals and different toxins. And then it feels sick. So it comes to the surface, I think, to die. And you just scrape them off and put more down. And uh, we took all of those worms to the hazardous fill because they were all now above safe standards. And after three applications of worms, which was about a month, uh, the whole place was clean. And in fact, they built a park and they are farming uh, different crops there and it's a safe place to farm. That whole thing, again, was like $25,000 over about five months of work our technical experts donating their time to show how to do this, and then local people learning how to do the projects themselves and working out how to be able to fix these problems themselves. So we did a lot of these you know, small projects, often funded by myself from the company, occasionally with assistance, like you know, board members provided assistance, um, a little bit of grant money coming from a few different places, and now we're starting to get the attention of people like the European Commission, who gave us a small, mid-sized grant, and others. And as we're doing this, we start to find bigger problems and worse problems. And this is a place uh, 
in the Ukraine, in the eastern part of the Ukraine, that's now been annexed by Russia. And uh, it's a factory that was uh, manufacturing TNT, trinitrotoluene, for the bombs that were used in, in World War II. They say it was like 75% of all the munitions were manufactured in this plant. And um, when they were manufacturing this material, they would first make an intermediate chemical called mononitrochlorobenzene, MNCB. And uh, they would then stockpile that until they got an order for TNT, and then turn the factory on and start making TNT out of the mononitrochlorobenzene. So they'd make that first in the background while they were waiting for, waiting for orders. Well, Soviet Union collapsed, and they didn't get any orders for about a decade. And um, they made tons and tons and tons of MNCB, and it's very toxic. The, uh, half a gram is enough to kill you. It's very acutely toxic stuff. So they would store it, and then at some point, the factory owners realized they were never going to get any more money or orders, and they just told everyone to walk away. And so the 800 workers there left, and they put one guard out front, and for five years or six years, the factory stayed there, slowly degrading. And uh, I was um, nearby doing a training course for our evaluation experts. We have people who go out to toxic sites and do a particular evaluation to work out how toxic it is and put it into a database. It's one of our core programs. It's called the Toxic Sites Inventory. And I was training uh, half a dozen people to do this in parts of uh, the former Soviet Union. And I'm there, and we're explaining something on site about how to use some technical equipment. There's a dozen of us, and these two big black SUVs drove up, parked about 100 yards away, and a guy barks out the window. And our Russian coordinator goes over and comes back, and he says, Rich, they want you. I said, what? He says, I can't say, but you have to go. So I walked over, and, and this guy looks out, and he says, get in the car. <laughs> and I said, what? He says, you have to get in. So I, I got in the car, and now I'm terrified. My Russian guy gets in, and he squishes in the back. They're enormous guys. They've got the hat on, everything. And they start arguing, talking in Russian. And I figured he's you know, basically begging for my life or our lives or whatever. And we drive away. And I turn around, and I could see all of, all of our training people. They're following. They, they got into the van. They're following. I'm thinking, thank God. At least they'll know where to pick up the body and send it home to my family. <laughs> um, and then after a while, this conversation, I turned back to Vladimir, our guy, and he looks at me, and you can see the fear on my face, and he said, no, 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 Rich, it's okay. This is the mayor of the town, and they want our help. <laughs> so we drove to this abandoned factory, and I had with me the head guy for the US Army, who was on sabbatical and doing some work with us. Um, and he's the guy in charge of all the remediation for the US Army. And he and I walked into this abandoned factory, which was kind of closed off, but not very. And he looked and he looked at this thing and saw the name of the chemical name of it. And he could see these bags of waste spilling open and all of these drums that had fallen over and piles of this stuff just everywhere. And he looked at me and his face went ashen white. And he said, get out, let's get out of here. And we left. And they had um, 150 tons of mononitro abandoned all around this facility. But worse, they had TNT still in the pipes and in such a place so that if a wall fell and the TNT went off, it would not only destroy and throw all this mononitro into the air, it would also destroy an ammonia tank, 150,000 gallons of ammonia from a factory next door. And we were above the level of the town. We were 200 feet above the level of the town, 120,000 people. So if, the, if this thing blew, the tanks would blow, the ammonia would blow, all the ammonia would wash down, and we would have an event five times bigger than Chernobyl and Bhopal combined. We would have had 20, 30, 50,000 people die within 20 minutes. So uh, we went back to a hotel. We drank a lot, and we came up with a plan. <laughs> Um, we uh, brought a technical team from BASF, from Dow, from the US Army, all of them volunteers. I went to the local European office and they gave me a million dollars pretty much sight unseen. 
when I told them what was going on. And um, the Ukrainian government also stepped in with a very large uh, piece of money. And we brought in experts who trained local Ukrainian army people, because we didn't want to do it, full protective gear, go in and package up this stuff. And we shipped it all um, to a Dow facility in Germany which had plasma destruction. So they just destroyed all this stuff. Um, it took about, the whole thing took about eight months to do. And, uh, and the place is, is now safe. The strange story is that it also got annexed by the Russians. So whatever's left over now is no longer Ukraine's problem, at least for the moment. But it, no one's going to die acutely from all that. So, you know, these are the sort of things that we started to do. Oh, by the way, Dennis and Deb, where are you guys? Dennis and Deb, thank you first for inviting me here. These are two super experts of our technical advisory group. And Laura is here too, I think. Are you here as well? Another technical advisor. These are the folk who volunteer their time to go out in the field and work out how to fix these problems. And here is a problem of lead in Indonesia and Philippines that they were looking at. Here is Dennis explaining how to be able to manage redesign of a very toxic uh, lead site in the Philippines and make it a safe place for the kids to live. So, so we're starting now to get more and more professional and more established and to do things at greater scale, sometimes in places that were extraordinarily toxic. This is a town in, in Africa called Kabwe, uh, 250,000 people. Um, average blood level is uh, 20 times the worst we saw in Flint. That's the average for that town. Um, and um, I think everyone there is permanent, got permanent brain damage and serious problems with neurological uh, issues uh, day to day. It's a place that, you know, the schools just don't work. The kids just can't learn. And uh, cardiovascular problems are acute. We've been working there now for 20 years and Josh, you remember we finally got a World Bank grant there to do some work, and it all got gobbled up by the government. Now we've started a new one. We're not getting the money, but we're overseeing it. We're hoping it will do better. Sometimes it takes such a long time, but we're persistent. I am absolutely persistent that this problem will get fixed in the long term. So pilot projects, doing these programs on the ground, teaching Locals, bringing capacity and financing from overseas, teaching people how to do this so they can replicate it. It goes a long way, but it's not enough. And what we found as we were doing this was that this problem wasn't a part of the development agenda in these countries. It wasn't like when the Minister of Finance and the Prime Minister sat down and said, now, what are we going to do this term? They'd say, well, we've got to do education, we've got to do... Uh, uh, HIV and malaria for health, we've got to do primary health services, we've got to do um, a climate, uh, we've got to do some work on biodiversity and forests, and they would never say pollution. And they would never know that a quarter of their people were dying from pollution either. So we needed to, you know, work out how to be able to get to them and also get to the people that provide a lot of their money, which are the wealthy countries' development agencies. So what I did next was form a group to try and deal with all of that. Because doing it as an NGO based in New York, we don't have enough credibility to really do this capably. So I started this group called the Global Alliance on Health and Pollution. And it's the Ministry for Environment of, and the Ministry of Health of 50 countries, India, Mexico, Argentina, Brazil, you name it, um, and the World Bank, UN agencies, all of them. Um, and this is the group that is committed to put a pollution onto the development agenda. And by fits and starts, it's trying to bring enough focus into this issue to make it um, uh, part of how we deal with the world. So it becomes an issue where we can show that fantastic success that so many other issues have already had over time. Um, and I use this chart in my presentations to talk about it. This is 9 million deaths from pollution, and here's 3 million deaths from HIV, malaria, and tuberculosis. Here's how much money we spent in 2015 on HIV, malaria, and tuberculosis. 
That's $27 billion, billion. And here's how much money we spent on pollution. It was around $30 million, of which we were five or six. So clearly, there's a disconnect that needs to be dealt with. I also, remember I showed you that Lancet report showing nine million deaths? I also try and tell people that that science is incomplete because in the chemicals and soil pollution, we're only measuring lead. That's the only toxin that has enough data for it to be included by WHO. Instead, if we were to look at other things, other chemicals, like mercury, like arsenic, like asbestos, chromium, like PCPs, all those sort of things, and add them up, and we in fact would have a much higher number. Instead of being one million, it would be more like three and a half million, and nine million would go to 12 million deaths. So air pollution is beginning now to get attention in the development agenda. We need the chemicals and, uh, and soil pollution also to be included. And the other, the other main issue, way we're bringing this to the attention is something that actually is kind of scary when we started to research it. It's how much these toxins overseas end up coming back and biting us here. And a lot of it makes sense. Air pollution, air doesn't respect any boundaries and borders, but it's not just that, it's also different kinds of chemicals and toxins that move as well. And they move to us in the food supply. Let me show you how that does. And by the way, there's a wonderful report that we put out called Pollution Knows No Borders, you can see on our website. So it gives all the science behind this. This is all very solid science and research behind all of this. Um, you know that air pollution is a substantive issue in low and middle income countries. We talked at dinner how Indonesia burning palm trees affects Malaysia and Singapore and sometimes Thailand and, and even Japan. But in fact, coal burning in China goes all the way across the Pacific and impacts um, San Francisco. 29% of particulates in San Francisco come from the coal fields in China. You see this boiling mass? This is particulates, PM25. Look how they streak across here and end up boiling down and ending up uh, heating into San Francisco. So air pollution moves toxic materials around the world just in the normal streams of things. More worrisome for me too was finding out that a great number of farmers can't use bore water anymore for, for watering their crops because climate has put such a pressure on it that the water tables have dropped. And instead they're reverting to the only source of water they can use, industrial wastewater. And you know that you know, we're not treating industrial wastewater in these poor countries at all well. And now it ends up on the crops. And there is a partner group for us who's looking at metal and mercury and chromium in wheat and rice. And you think that when you buy a hamburger, for example, that the beef has come from you know, the Midwest, from a nice cow there, and the wheat, for the bun has been grown somewhere in the US and it all feels nice and safe. That's not the way the world works anymore. The products are actually sourced in a global food supply system where things are mixed and brought, bought for lowest price. And wheat harvested in India is just as likely to end up in that burger as wheat harvested in, uh, in Iowa. Same is true for for fish, 80% um, of our fish is imported. We don't test much of it. FDA, the last time, until their budgets were slushed by Trump, put out a report where they measured, um, they showed the results of their tests of imported fish. They only tested one-tenth of 1% 1 of fish that were imported into the US. But they rejected 9.7% for toxic issues. So even though there is only a small amount being checked, still so much, of, and by the way, that's random testing as well. So these toxins occurring 
internationally, these exposures internationally are coming back to us in all sorts of different ways. And I think that's uh, really of concern. And what I really want to make sure we think of when we're dealing with this and looking at the risk to our own families. And by the way, these levels that are measured, both the levels in, in fish and the levels in hamburger buns and pizza and things like this, they're very low. They're not much above standards. And the standards are set at a very low, at a safe level. So they're not at a level that I am telling my kids not to eat anything here yet. But they are growing. And they'll only get worse unless we deal with the problem at the source. Because this is not something in the global food supply that you can stop by controlling imports or putting in more, more uh, controls and regulations. Instead, we need to go to the source, to these places where these toxins are getting into the global food supply or getting into the air and help them to deal with it at that place. So this is now my pitch using the Global Alliance as a platform and out talking around the world for what we need to do to deal with this issue, an issue that we don't really know about terribly well. But really, we ought to prioritize this as a health problem. It's the biggest health problem. And then solve the problem at the source and do this with some development assistance, but with countries also providing and beginning programs to deal with it. And when we think about that, I try to bring the folk that are, have decision-making in this to focus on a couple of very specific projects and programs. And the first is about lead. You know, lead, flint, we know is a bad problem. But lead is an extraordinary problem globally. Um, not many people know, but right now we're looking at um, WHO showing that lead kills one million people a year. Not from brain damage, that's young kids, but from cardiovascular disease. A recent report in The Lancet showed that lead levels in all of us are responsible for as much cardiovascular disease in the US as smoking. In fact, a little more than smoking. And that makes lead, even the levels that we have, which is you know, stuff we had from when I was a kid, from when lead was in gasoline, even those low levels of lead are responsible for causing as much heart disease as smoking is, even though in the US. And so this is a pernicious product that mostly is found in car batteries. 90% of lead is used in car batteries. Unfortunately, we can't get away from the car battery because our car industry is growing, so the car batteries are growing as well. And, and the way that they're recycled internationally is terrible. And there's a whole lot of programs we need to work on car batteries. This young man here is smashing open a car battery. You can see all this waste lead all over. And uh, usually this is done in the backyard or at a storefront um, or you know, uh, around the, uh, their local uh, industrial area in a, in a village with lots of children around as well. The other thing that I want people to focus on is industrial wastewater being used in agriculture. And we're partnering now with the World Bank on this where we'll overlay um, industri industrial agricultural areas with industrial wastewater and see where the key focuses there are, and then begin to prioritize the solution. And the solution is to put in industrial wastewater treatment plants in these places. So they're still using water, but it's clean water. So a long way to go in that area, but these, I think, are places where we can have a significant impact. So, that brings you back to where we are now. Um, this lovely planet and a place that I think generally um, in the last 100 years has, we've been successful in it. We've done a lot of great things in it. We've caused though a lot of stress, generally inadvertently, on a series of different areas of the planet. Our animals and plants and biota and climate too. I want us to put pollution into this mix as well. And I need your help for this. And what I would like is that in your discussions, when you're talking about how the world's doing, to see if we can't include this issue as well, to talk about this and spread, spread this message. This is something that we ought to be dealing with. It's killing a lot of people, more people than we know. And it's putting all of us at risk at a certain level. And we are not thinking about it. But it's time we did. 
So for that, I'm going to turn it over to questions and thank you for all of your time. So the grass that's appropriate to use in a particular circumstance like PCBs in your neighborhood, I would first speak to Deb and Dennis or Laura, the technical experts who really understand this sort of thing, if that's what you're looking for. Just as a good example of you know, one way that you can deal with these sort of toxins, the website's got great stories, got tons and tons of stories of all the different things we've done. So, yeah. Yes, sir. Um. You mentioned at the beginning of your talk that uh, at some point the birth rate and the death rate are going to equal. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and we know that in Western society, that uh, other than the two world wars, the birth rate hasn't equaled the death rate since the Black Plague. Um, do you expect this to decrease the number of births or increase the number of deaths? Well, it's a great question. I and got two parts. Two parts. Okay. Yeah, but go ahead. Okay, so I don't know the answer to this. I'm looking at what. UN population looks at in their projections. I do know that when people, when, uh, when economies get wealthier and more successful, and women are educated, that their, um, the number of children they have reduces substantially. One thing I read recently, Bangladesh is growing now at 0.8% per year, which is actually a little less than the US is growing. The US is growing at 0.9% per year, most of it through migration. And Bangladesh, goodness me, what is it, 280 million people? It's like 2.5%. It's, it's, no, it's less than 1% yeah, right it now. Was. It used to be, it used to be enormous. It used to be 4% and a lot, a lot, a lot of both, but it's, all, it's come down so substantially. Well, I'm just okay. thinking that uh, we don't want to increase the death rate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I couldn't agree more. We all want to live healthy well, and successful, yeah. actually increasing the death rate. Yeah. Um, the other thing is, Environmental toxicity. Um, in the old days, we were always worried that uh, population would outstrip production or our finite resources. We didn't know that we were going to have a toxic environment. Uh, I'm looking at uh, pharmaceutical and agricultural chemicals. Yes. Which are spread, I mean, we have uh, Roundup being spread on fields around here, um, and there's no control over that. And then um, I'm thinking of uh, from Agent Orange. Which we saw, mm -hmm. and then um, there, there are other chemicals, atrazine. Yes. And atrazine is, they, I talked to a, a farmer back in 1970, and I said, What are you spraying on the field? He said, Atrazine. And I said, What's it do? He says, It kills everything but corn. Everything but corn, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And that was yeah. just great for him. Yeah. Um, but is there, you're, you seem to be focusing on certain locations that, right. that are you know, hot spots. I, I am, and let me, let me tell you why. Um, the process in our working is to look to see uh, where is the largest cause of death overall. And we do this by looking at the toxin and its dose-response relationship in terms of health impact. And usually there's a curve where a certain amount of dose will give a certain amount of health impact. And there are some metrics that you know, all of the scientists use in this. And so we'll look for what is the exposure out there, how much people are getting, and how many people are being impacted, and look then to calculate the overall impact of that particular problem. So if it's PCBs on your piece of land, how many people are actually getting in that particular level of PCBs and putting them into their body, and then what does that do in terms of health? And calculating that, and I know it's somewhat of a you know, very mechanical thing to do, but when we do this time and time again through different uh, sites and different places around the world, we can begin then to prioritize and say, you know, not as an emotional response, but really as where can we put our money to do the most good? And where can we invest so we can save the most lives and make the most impact globally? And that helps then to say, should we really be focusing on glyphosate? 
should we really be focusing on just the remnants of atrazine? The money that gets spent on Agent Orange in Vietnam, I think, is a waste of time because there's less than one-tenth of a dally associated with it right now. The money that gets spent on the Hudson River on cleaning up the PC, P PCBs, PCBs in the Hudson River, has got like two dallies over the next uh, 10 years associated with it. It's ridiculously small, and they're going to spend $250 million. You give me $250 million, I'll save 5 million lives over the next 10 years. So these are the sort of things that I think need to happen. We need to look at this as a priority rather than as a knee-jerk reaction that says no, no, no. Where does it fit? Because there is a limited amount of money and attention that can be brought to these things. That's the start of why we're working overseas as well, as you can see, right? Yeah. Great question, though. Thank you. You were talking about uh, uh, taking uh, toxic materials and taking them out of harm's way or, or out of the way of harming humans. And in one case, I thought it was great that the plasma destroyed the TNT factories. Right. I know. It's, it's not, yeah. it, you know, all solutions aren't great, and I wish you could destroy that stuff, but do you worry about that? It's, it's the problem with the uh, elements, elemental table, and things that are elements you can't destroy. So you can't actually destroy lead. You know, we can't put it in a, a burner and destroy it. It's still lead. It's just gone up the chimney. You can't actually turn it into things that are harmless. So, so metals, uh, radionuclides, uh, you can't actually uh, treat them. All we can do is put them away in safe places. Um, uh, organic chemicals, pesticides, those sort of things, you can break them down and turn them into carbon dioxide and water and, and innocuous things. And there, that's what we'll do in those kind of circumstances. But it's the, the immutable elements that cause the problem. It's not terrible because lead has always been around. It's in the earth, we've dug it up, now we're just putting it back to its old home again. <laughs> and, and what we'll often do in these places is we'll put it in a place we don't think people will ever get to. We'll take the, the dump site, we'll dig down often 100 meters to the very bottom of the dump site and we'll make a, a pod down there and then we'll fill up all the garbage on top of it. And uh, you know, maybe that will work. In a thousand years, I can't say, but it, seems, it feels pretty good to me. First of all, thanks for your talk. Uh, question about regulatory capture or government capture by interests that are essentially working at cross purposes uh, of what you hope to achieve. Right. And there's clear risk of that in the US these days, but I'm asking you with respect to the developing world, uh, over time, what in the period of time you've been working on this problem, have the regulatory and governmental interests become Better partners? Uh, have, they, you know, been res have they resisting capture by you know, some of the industries that are you know, essentially contributing to the problem? So, what do you see? Yeah, it's a good question. It's a good question. And um, we see a couple of things here. Some of them may be a little controversial. The first thing is uh, large multinational companies are generally not at fault here. And most of these toxins are not being created by these big multinational companies. In fact, if you've got a Dow Chemical or you know, a BASF who's part of an industrial estate you know, in Thailand, uh, they will have squeaky clean operations. They'll run them as well as they would their operations in the US. It's not squeaky clean, but as clean as they do. And they'll generally bring the rest of the industrial estate up to that level. So they'll have central pollution control equipment and great monitoring and be pretty complicit, uh, compliant with the local regulations and the rest of it. And so will the rest of the estate. And then you drive 80 miles down the coast to a place where it's all local industries and it's a shithole. So, so that's the first thing. Also, when I look in our database of acutely toxic sites, you know, we have 5,000 sites in that database. Each of them is worse than Love Canal. And some of them are 100 times worse than Love Canal. And we have, in that data collection, who caused the pollution? Who's responsible for it? Who are the responsible parties? 
and who are the government agencies and the rest of it. So we can search in that database to see if there are the big Fortune 1000 European and US companies, and we did that recently. And in that 5,000, there was one site that actually had a big company who was associated with it. So most of these sites are uh, small local companies um, or they're people who are doing livelihood work. And, and Deb and Dennis know this very well. A lot of these operations are simply people who are you know, feeding their families in a lot of cases and doing it in a way that's acutely toxic. So that's one thing. The second thing is about how well governments are responsive to this issue. All of these governments, they're very dramatically from place to place, but they all typically have pretty good regulations in play. And when they're enforcing those regulations, they're usually turning to only to the big companies. Where they're lacking is the ability to work in the informal sector or the smaller company level. And so people might be able to get um, a certificate that says they have a license to operate, but there's no one really watching over them and they don't have the resources to be able to do that. And so when we go and work with the government and their regulatory agency and say, let's help you with these toxic sites, by the way, they're the informal sector, they generally don't even know what to do. They're keen, but they really lack much know-how about how to move forward with it. Yeah. With social media expanding and incredible documentaries like um, uh, Blue River about uh, uh, Levi Fly, yeah, Blue Bee Rivers all, all around the world. Um, what can you hope, what would be your fantasy to see getting the word out? And as we get the word out, does it really matter? Does it really just come down to where are you going to get the money where, to, to make the next step forward? Yeah, for me, it's not about us getting the money. Yes, we need money to keep doing this work. Instead, it's about this issue becoming part of the conversation for how we ought to be running the world. And for, you know, I've worked very hard to have this be a part of the SDGs. But a year before the SDGs were finalized, there was no pollution in it whatsoever. Define SDGs. Say? Define SDGs. Oh, sorry, guys. SDGs is Sustainable Development Goals. It's the plan for how the world is moving forward. Uh, 196 countries have agreed to this group of 17 goals, talking about health and poverty and education and climate and all sorts of things. And it's an important roadmap for where and how we ought to be running the world and making it a place that's OK for 11 billion people to live on. But you know, until we actually came and started to look at this, They've been discussing for seven or eight years how the SDGs would look with no conversation on pollution. And we managed to get it put in at the last minute into the health goal. Frankly, if we had it started five years earlier, it, there would have been an SDG just around pollution. But I, I think on where we need to go with this long term, I think on how Al Gore just presented and presented and presented until people finally said, I got it, and started to work on climate. And I think that's the, the space that we're in right now, building a coalition of people who understand this issue and want to talk about it and want to bring it into conversations to move forward. You know, we finally got pollution be recognized um, within the non-communicable disease agenda at the World Health Organization. Non-communicable diseases are cancer and heart disease. And pollution in the poorer countries is the biggest cause of those two things. But WHO, until we finally got them to do this, was only recognizing uh, diet, obesity, uh, exercise, and lifestyle issues. They weren't recognizing pollution as a significant cause of these matters. So there's some slow pickup that's moving along as we go forward. Look, if we would have the BBC call up and say, David Attenborough wants to do a movie about this, we would be, it would be fantastic. But, how do we get to that point? And will he stay alive long enough to do it? And Josh is saying no. But this, that's the sort of thing we need to do. We, we need to, I mean, I have every week a new um, uh, videographer saying, I really want to do a documentary about what you're doing. It's amazing. And I say, that's great. And then I wait, because the next question is, and by the way, can you pay for it? Because I don't have any money. And then and I say, well, not really, but maybe. And then, and then I say, how will you get it out? And they say, oh, could you do that as well? Could you get it out? So, you know, 
it's, it's, a, it's a process. And the world has so many different people tweeting and, and Facebooking and so many different agendas trying to have this become one that people are looking at. It's big enough. It deserves it. It's hard. It's a slow, hard process. So I know you had a question. I'm dying to hear it. Yeah. Well, don't die now. I know. OK. OK. I think it's generally accepted that pollution and climate change are both existential threats to our climate. Yeah, we have in the United States right now a political situation which uh, encourages deregulation, causing more pollution, and out of the necessity for people to breathe and to get elected. And so I see the final cause here as being political. The only thing that will stop this is at the ballot box. I'm with you, <laughs> completely. I mean, you know, we still do get money from USAID, but I don't want anyone to know that because I don't want to get anyone to tell the White House that we do because they might cut it off. But um, honestly, uh, you know, there's a step backwards in a lot of different uh, places around the world from looking at the world with love from all angles. And uh, I can't wait for the pendulum to swing back a little more to you know, the direction of us all getting on and caring as a global citizens for everyone and all of us. So. Thank you very much. <laughs>